I am Jeff Kaufman. Uh, I head up QuickBooks Financing. Uh, at Intuit, QuickBooks Financing helps to make the small business lending process faster and easier. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to help you small business owners, accountants, find fast, easy financing. So we're going to do a couple things today. First off, wanted to start off the presentation by talking a little bit about the state of the industry. So it has been rough out there. Uh, going to give you a little bit of a feel for the competitive landscape, not to scare you, but to help you understand the context of what we're trying to achieve here. Next, we have a customer here, Erica, uh, who is a QuickBooks financing customer and a QuickBooks user. And she's going to share with you, we have a video which highlights some of the struggles she went through, as well as really highlight, if you can unlock financing, how you can really help your business thrive. From there, we'll move. I'm super excited. We have a great panel assembled here. Uh, we have James Hobson, who is the COO of OnDeck, who's going to talk a little bit about his products, provide some tips and uh, recommendations on how to make the process easier. Uh, AL is from Funbox, and Funbox provides invoice receivable financing. So we'll talk a little bit about that product and how you could utilize your invoices uh, to unlock your working capital. So instead of getting paid in 30, 60 days, unlocking it to get paid immediately. And then on the end, we have Spencer, who's joining us from Kiva Zip. So Kiva Zip, crowdfunding uh, website for social good, providing 0% loans to small businesses, a lot of small businesses that are really struggling to get financing and offer a great option uh, before some of the banking options that we'll talk about. So with that said, why don't we jump into it? I mentioned that the state of lending is challenging. So about two and a half years ago, we surveyed the marketplace. Uh, we went out to QuickBooks customers, found out some pretty surprising things. So first off, the number two pain point. So small business owners were saying, number one, I need to grow revenue for my business. After they booked the sale, there was this oh crap moment, this moment of, Okay, great, I got the sale, the business is starting to take off, how am I gonna finance the inventory? How am I gonna get the equipment that I need to get my business going? When we talked to customers, we found a couple things. So first off, number two pain point, because they were spending so much time. They were spending on average 33 hours filling out paperwork, getting all the documentation that was required. They were going to, on average, three to seven different financial institutions where they were providing all this information. And then once all that information was in, the waiting continued. It took a week and a half to find out if they were approved or declined, and then it took a couple more weeks to actually close the loan facility. And on top of that, on top of all that waiting, they were ending up with a 70% decline rate. So we started to look at that and said, what's, what's going on here? Why, why is that so high and what can we do to help? What we started to find was the decline rate often had very little to do with the strength of the business and more to do with this difficulty of getting right information at the right point in time and this difficulty of the small business really representing their health. And because it was taking so long to provide the documentation, a lot of the traditional banks were essentially giving up and saying, I can't find the information I need, so I'll evaluate the owner instead. Well, you guys all know the story of small business owners. You start your business up with credit cards, home equity lines, whatever it takes to get started. So it was no surprise that personal financials weren't great. So our panel today will talk a lot about how to highlight the business, how to change those stats around. The other thing I wanted to point out, so that was on the small business side, that for traditional banks, what were they going through in this process? Was it painful too? And what we started to see from our research was very much yes. So the banks were spending as much time uh, analyzing, doing the due diligence that they needed to do on these smaller 50K loans as they were these million dollar loans. So there was definitely some pain there. The ROI was out of sync bad debt was high, and again, the bad debt had little to do with the strength of the business, but because they were evaluating the owner of the business, right? So if you're not looking at the business health, it's the business at the end of the day that's gonna repay the loan. That's what's gonna provide the cash flow. 
If you focus just on the owner, if the business starts to go south, they're going to utilize their own credit uh, to help fund the business, right? At the end of the day, this is their passion, this is what they're building, and there won't be much left. So we see this disconnect in data creating problems, not only for the small business owner, but also for the traditional banks. So the traditional banks responded in ways you could imagine. They started to leave the marketplace. On average, since 2008, loan volume for traditional banks declining about 3%. So if you look back to 2008, you could see overall about a 20% decline in volume. That's why I'm super excited to have this panel who are here to help solve this problem, really, right? There was a void in the marketplace, new types of loans, new types of products, and as we jump into the, product, uh, the panel, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Before we jump into that, though, I mentioned in the beginning how important the loan process is, right? So even though the environment was difficult, businesses that can unlock the cop capital they need really have the ability to thrive. So Erica Barrett is here with us today. I'm going to play a short video, uh, and then we'll ask a couple questions of Erica. My name is Erica Barrett, and I'm the founder of Southern Culture Artisan Foods. We manufacture and make pancake and waffle mixes, flavored grits, and all things that are Southern and breakfast. We started off at a shared kitchen, and probably about three or four months in, we started to get lots of customers. So eventually my husband and I said, you know, we need to find our own location. For traditional lenders, they typically require three years tax statements. They want your bank statements. They want every single piece of information they can collect on you, except for your blood type. <laughs> you know, trying to make money and be successful and having to provide all of these documents, never knowing three or four weeks later if you're actually gonna get the money that you need to grow your business. It's a lot to worry about. With QuickBooks Financing, I immediately knew that I was pre-approved, and then I just went through a couple of steps, put in some vital information, uh, provided minimal documents, and I had the money, and it was just like the best gift ever. I was able to build out our retail store. I was able to get the kitchen equipment that I needed. Our operation here now is our flagship location, where we manufacture all of our pancake and waffle mixes for stores all over the world. Um, we're in close to 4,000 stores now, which has all been made possible by QuickBooks Financing. Oh man, compared to what I've been through with traditional lenders, I would definitely give QuickBooks Financing a 10. 11 if I could. Um, I think we should change the scale. Awesome, well thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that with the video too. Um, love your story, love your quote too of how hard it was. I think they uh, asked for everything but the blood type. Absolutely. Uh, which I'm happy to say is not a new form of big data. So good news on that front. <laughs> So I was wondering if you could share with the group, you, you talk about it was a difficult process. Any tips or recommendations that you'd give to other small business owners uh, having gone through the experience already? Um, you know, I guess it was kind of good that I went through the process and it was difficult for me because I wouldn't wish that on anybody else. <laughs> um, I was in business for about two and a half years and I was growing at such a rapid pace with uh, large big box retailers. Um, and as a manufacturer, you have to purchase all of these raw materials and you have to wait for all of these big box stores to uh, essentially pay you. So the process, uh, the sales cycle is about 60 to 90 days. Right. Um, and if you can't find money fast enough, it could put you out of business uh, if you don't have family or friends or someone who just has money sitting there that you can grab. And, and that was my situation. So, um, you know, after getting turned down from banks and um, a lot of other uh, traditional lenders, I received this QuickBooks email saying that I was pre-approved for something. I was just like, well, man, I've gotten turned down for so many things, but hey, why not give it a try? Um, you know, so the first lender that I actually got approved by was on deck. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the amount that I got was like around $65,000, which was the most money that I was able to get, you know, <laughs> since I had been in business and I was ecstatic. Um, and it happened during fourth quarter, which is where we make about 50% of our revenue in three months. Um, so I was able to purchase inventory, um, you know, just kind of help build out our retail store and then also get the equipment that we needed to um, kind of stay up to date and, and, and make sure that our customers got their orders on time. So um, there's so many tools now with QuickBooks Online. You can literally download all of these apps. Um, I, you know, I was able to pay off my on-deck loan um, and I also use Bluevine and then I use Funbox as well now. Um, so for me, being a manufacturer, if I already have these invoices that I've built, um, 
you know, I'm able to get my money and collect on it and pay a small fee uh, for being able, you know, to, make, to be able to make payroll worry-free or to be able to pay a vendor worry-free. Um, it's been a huge relief for me and it's one of those things where now I can sleep at night knowing that I have financing at my fingertips. So I encourage everybody who's, you know, definitely using QuickBooks um, online, um, it literally takes seconds now to, to get money. Awesome. Appreciate that. So we're at QB Connect and there's a lot of talk during the show about the power of having the accounting data behind the cloud uh, and accessible and able to be used for things such as a business loan. Um, any information or types of data that you'd recommend for the group that they should be staying on top of using the software for? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I look at my profit and loss statement every day. Mm -hmm. um, I look at my sales statements. Like, you right. know, I want to see where I am in sales. I uh, just checked it this morning. Mm -hmm. um, I usually like to keep that stuff at my fingertips. Um, as long as you have that information, you know, profit and loss, balance sheets, um, that's typically um, what lenders are looking at. Um, make sure your invoicing is up to date. You know, when I get a sale, the first thing I do is enter the invoice um, because that invoice is very valuable data um, for any financing company. Sure. Um, and it helps with your sales. It, it, you know, it, it boosts your sales. You're able to collect on that money. So um, just kind of keeping those things up to date really gives you an accurate picture on a daily basis of uh, where you are financially and then what you're capable of borrowing from a lender. So right. those are the three things that I mainly use with inside QuickBooks Online. Awesome. Thank you. So the last question I wanted to ask you, you, you talk in the video a little bit about the different ways you were able to use the money. And you know, at, at first the process was difficult. Um, really sounds like it helped you to thrive. Any things that you found after you got the money that you were able to invest in that you didn't even think of when you were applying? Any surprises along the way? Uh, I was able to hire uh, more people. Um, one of the biggest things I think everybody kind of shares this pain with me is payroll is, is like a huge bill. <laughs> um, definitely for me. Um, I have 10 employees now um, and I was afraid to bring on more people and we were understaffed. Um, all I was thinking about is raw materials and, you know, packaging and all of these different ingredients that I needed to use. But I really, really needed help. Um, and I was able to take that money and um, be able to pay people on time and have the confidence that I could, you know, bring on more employees, which have you know, again, it's one of those things where I'm able to sleep at night because I don't have to do, <laughs> do all of the work now. I sleep a lot more now. Since I have finance, I sleep a lot more. Yeah. Reinvesting the hours. In, yeah, uh, in absolutely. Like sleep. That's a great thing. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, before we, we jump over to the panel, wanted to talk a little bit. So we talked about the state of the union with traditional banks and um, how some of that has been changing and some of the new opportunities to make it faster and easier. So. You know, the, the old way that the process would start, making an appointment at the local bank, um, meet with a banker in person, so you'd be assigned a loan officer. Um, you'd fill out paperwork. In many cases, a lot of paperwork. There are a lot of questions out there. Um, you start to, three years of financials, you have to physically print them out and provide them. The new method, though, is a lot more streamlined. So starting to see an emergence, a lot of technology in QuickBooks financing, for example, with your permission, you can utilize your QuickBooks data to essentially pre-populate uh, a lot of the documentation. Uh, if you are integrating, for example, your checking account information, that's available to pre pop uh, applications and use that in the evaluation. We're also starting to see the rise of some new forms of data. So social media is starting to come into play. Talk a little bit more about that, some web reviews. Have a question for the panel too, so we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But in terms of the social media and the information we've been seeing, we've started to hear things such as Yelp reviews and Amazon reviews, and we get the question a lot of time, you know, every now and then I get a bad review. Is that going to block me out of uh, the banking uh, area? And the answer is, of course not. It will not. But some of this new data helps to supplement. So still important to have those, you know, strong scores and business standing uh, from places such as DMB and Experian. But even those companies are starting to integrate these new forms of uh, social media. Uh, and really what it's doing, when you take a loan, there's very much this dynamic of looking what's going to happen in the future. And in many cases, this social media information is a great proxy 
uh, for customers and what volume looks like going forward. Okay, so that sets the context a little bit. Um, wanted to jump into the panel, and maybe if we can start off, um, I'll have each panel member introduce themselves, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about the products you provide, uh, and even some of the, the demographics, new business, more established businesses uh, that you help out. So James, maybe if you can start. Sure, great, thank you. Um, as uh, Jeff said, I'm James uh, from On Deck, and um, to give you the background on On Deck, um, our goal was to make the lending process for small businesses much more um, streamlined and frictionless. And so we've been at it since 2007. Um, what we've been trying to do is very much what, what Jeff said, which is take that stack of paper that small businesses were asked to create and basically digitize all of that so then we could build models that are much more predictive than, say, your FICO score, because your FICO score is about you as an individual not about the financial health of your business. And Jeff mentioned some of the challenges of, of actually needing to use personal capital to fund a business. Um, and so we've built the on-deck score. It's now in its fifth version, um, and it's incredibly predictive of the financial health of your business because it only looks at your business. Um, and if you look at what we've had to do in taking that stack of paper and translating it to data is we've built a bunch of data connections. Um, but our, our biggest challenge was getting that data. So we now have over 100 different uh, data connections, but we do that very quickly. So once you submit to uh, on deck, which is you know, basically like a credit card application, uh, it takes about five minutes to fill it out. Jeff mentioned the power of sort of you know, working with a partner where we can pre-fill it. Um, but then we're gonna go out and we're gonna generate a score on you in about 15 seconds. Um, and that lets us then unlock uh, financing options to help your business. Um, the types of products that we now have, we've lent over $3 billion um, across uh, 700 different kinds of small businesses. So we're really looking to help every small business uh, that needs the capital to grow. Um, we have two products. Our first uh, product is a working capital uh, term loan. That's anywhere from $5,000 up to $500,000, anywhere from six months in term uh, to three years in term. Uh, and you know, our goal is to really right size the financing with the opportunity that you have at your business. Um, and we really, you know, we can talk more about that, but I think you know, you should be thinking about how is this capital going to help my business? How is it going to help us grow? How is it going to help us manage the business? And then try to find the right financing vehicle to meet that need. And then we also have a line of credit product um, that goes up to $100,000. Uh, and the way that we structured that is when we were doing research. We understood that um, the one thing customers didn't like was you know, the fact that you can you know, draw on a line like a credit card and then pay that off over, say, three years. So the way our product is structured is it has a defined pay down. You pay it off over six months in weekly payments. Um, and then uh, you, whenever you redraw, you, know, you can redraw and reset your six-month amortization. Great. Thank you. Eyal? Eyal uh, Shinas, co-founder and CEO of uh, Fumble. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm good. Both good. Here? Yep. Uh, now. Thanks. <laughs> Eyal Shinar, co-founder and CEO of Funbox. Uh, our sole purpose in life is to uh, eliminate the net plus 60 problem. So we not really regard ourselves as a lending company uh, or anything like that, although we're solving a very similar problem. Um, the philosophy is coming from, you know, the most, uh, I agree with the research that you just showed, and if you even go deep uh, deeper uh, layer into that, you see that the actual problem for most of the businesses that issue invoices is, you know, the time between they provide the product or the service until the time they get paid for that. And the irony is that the better you do and the faster you grow, the bigger the cash hole, you know, the, the cash flow gap is. So we're trying to mitigate that. So in a perfect world where technology is not an issue and everybody is aligned to the same purpose, uh, you would get paid once you issue the invoice. Uh, unfortunately, the world is not perfect yet. Uh, we're working very hard to uh, change that. And uh, our product is a very simple solution that we hope to bring it to that you know, ideal world where once you issue an invoice or once you have an invoice that is not paid, um, meaning that your business is relying on invoices as a way to communicate with your customers, um, we would be the link that allow you to get paid instantly. Uh, the way it works today, um, you register or you just connect through your uh, QuickBooks account. Takes probably one click time, uh, so a few seconds. 
once you do that, we're relying very heavily on QuickBooks data, which is solely your business data, not any FICO individual type of data. We couple that data, sometimes it's not enough, um, we couple that data with other data sources. And when I'm saying we, everything happens in the back uh, using very sophisticated algorithm. So it's 100% automatic process, there's no human intervention, uh, just making sure that nothing glitches. Um, and a customer can go to the platform, connect to the accounting software with a one click, and within anything between 40 seconds and four hours, um, assuming it was approved, can start clearing invoices. And when I'm saying clearing invoices, I mean, you see the dashboard of the invoices, you see all the invoices that are not paid yet, and the invoices that you can actually advance against, you click on an invoice, and it's funded in a bank account. Uh, today we're focusing only on that product. Uh, it's relatively uh, small amount per invoice uh, because the average invoice size is just, that's the way it is, it's relatively small. But the credit line is a, is a line that you get that could be anything from $2,000 all the way up to $50,000, depend on your business and your history with Funbox. And when you're tapping on invoices, you're basically tapping into this credit line. Um, and the more you use it, uh, the more credit you get and uh, the better terms you get. Um, longer term, we probably want to address other problems, but this is such a big problem, which is so personal and professional for us, that we're focusing on it as the first one. It's, it's big enough. And into it, specifically QuickBooks was a very good partner, because if you look at what QuickBooks is trying to do uh, in the grand scheme of the last 10 years, is you're taking very traditional services or products like you know, you could fill an accounting uh, using an Excel, an accounting spreadsheet using an Excel, um, and then print it and send over mail, and then Intuit came and basically automated and productized it to a much better user experience. The next step was for Intuit, um, QuickBooks more specifically, to allow your customer to pay you now directly from the invoice with our PayPal, Intuit product, or other products. Uh, but you need the customer to be incentivized to actually pay, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And now the next natural step would be for you to get paid instantly once you issue the invoice. You just click on it and the money is your bank account. Um, so the short answer, we're solving the net plus 60 problem. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Spencer, you guys are a new area or two with crowdfunding, which a lot of folks might not be as familiar with. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, just kind of some, for some context before I talk about Kiva Zip, who's familiar with the nonprofit Kiva? Generally. I am. Awesome. Um, so if you guys are familiar with Kiva, Kiva's been around for about 10 years. We started focusing internationally, uh, making very small scale loans to entrepreneurs in sub-Saharan Africa, specifically in Uganda. Um, but as we've learned here today, um, the same sort of problems for small businesses exist here in the United States, and it's very hard to receive funding. So in the last 10 years, we've done about $750 million in loan volume internationally in 83 countries. And we just started working here in the United States with the Kiva Zip program. So Kiva Zip is the U.S. fraction of Kiva. Um, and we are providing 0% interest loans to small scale businesses that are crowdfunded on our website from lenders all across the world who can lend as low as $25. Um, and I think one of the, the interesting pieces that's worth noting about Kiva Zip is, you know, we fo a lot of lenders are focused on the business, which we sure certainly look at, but the lens that we use to kind of judge creditworthiness is really on the business owner and character-based lending. So our product and kind of the process, uh, if you are a small business, is, is very simple, very easy. So if you visit Kiva Zip, um, we, look, we don't look at credit scores, cash flow, collateral. What we do is we look at your character and your network um, to decide if you're creditworthy or not. So if you were co to come to Kiva Zip and apply, all we're looking for is a great photo, um, a good personal description, a basic business description, what you think you might use the loan for. And then based on um, a couple small pieces of math, we come up with a number between five and 35 which is, excuse me, the number of lenders that you are required to bring on from your personal network, maybe friends and family, customer base, and you have a 15-day window to bring on those folks to lend you as low as $25.
And once you reach that 15th, 20th lender, then you're broadcasted onto our public platform where there are millions of people all across the world that can then contribute to your campaign. Um, and I think the greatest thing uh, about Kiva Zip right now is, is it's a constant revolving loan fund. So if, in, if you think about 10 years ago where you could go and lend $25 to a goat farmer in Uganda, for example, in two years, three years time, you'll get that money back and then can then relend that $25 to a basket weaver in, in South America. Well now, when you're on Kiva, you can now lend money to a local coffee shop down the street from you and can then get that money back and relend it to someone uh, where your son's daughters live. So it's a great way to engage $25 and support entrepreneurs like you over the course of, of year, many years. Um, and so the, the product that we offer, again, is a 0% interest loan that can be repaid over one to three years time. Um, and the process, again, is, is very easy, very quick. Uh, and we have now done about 2,000 loans in the U.S. so far. We're a new program, so we're, we're expanding pretty quickly. Um, and excited to uh, kind of talk more about it with all of you today. Great. Thank you. So as you can see, we have a diverse set of uh, financial products that are available. Why don't we jump right into some tips uh, for small business owners? Um, so James, you, you talked about term loans and lines of credit. As a small business thinks about applying, what are the first things they should do? And any recommendation how early to start the process? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a great question. I, I think the first thing that um, you know I would suggest is really sort of understand sort of what the opportunity is and and try to think through you know how it's going to impact your business. Um, because I do think, you know, the great thing now is I think there's a lot more options. Um, and I think that that's, that's something that, 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 you know, QuickBooks can really help with, um, with the network, network of lenders they have. So I think um, the first thing is have a really good understanding of what you want to do. Um, you know, I think four or five years ago when I talked to a lot of small business owners, there was this notion of, you know, you're going to apply to a bank and you have one chance. So if you get an approval, take as much money as you can for as long as, as long as possible, because it's gonna be the only loan you're gonna get. And I think what all of us are trying to do is sort of suggest that there's a much better solution. So understand what you want. And then what I would say is really do research on the lenders, which is I think you should be looking for a relationship, somebody that's gonna support your business, understand your business. So really make sure that you feel like they're gonna be there, um, because all of us I think are interested not just in sort of making a loan to help you with whatever the current need is, but to really help you grow your business over the long term. Um, and so, you know, I think if you know those two things, that can be really helpful. And then the last thing I would quickly say is just, um, you know, to Jeff's point, make information available. Um, you know, there's no magic when it comes to lending. We're all trying to figure out, um, you know, the credit quality of your business in, in some form or fashion. And so I think the more information we have, the better decision we can make. And I think the easier it is for us to get that, that means the easier the process is for you. So, you know, I think QuickBooks, whether it's your invoicing or your payroll um, or connecting your checking account, like Jeff said, that provides tremendous uh, information and really helps us, um, you know, really understand your business. And the better we understand your business, um, the better we can do to help. So I would say those, those are really the three things. Great, thanks. Al, you talked about uh, unlocking working capital uh, to help the business grow. Any tips, techniques for uh, folks out here as, as they start to think about uh, wanting to utilizing their invoicing for financing? Yeah, so first I would echo uh, your advice. Pretty good one. Um, I, I would make sure that, uh, <clears throat> and also Erica's. So w once you have the, the invoice out, once the data piece that is not somehow communicated to the world, <clears throat> meaning it's not digital, I would urge, you know, it's for your incentive to actually uh, input it somewhere just because it's another input that could increase the you know probability to use on the uh, fund box whatever the product that you need um, more specifically and again this goes back to your advice uh, James if you may need uh, a product that is a term loan for uh, $200,000 to open a new shop and that would be a very specific set of lenders or relationships that you want to create and let's say you actually draw that and use it and it works well and you're generating more revenue. Um, 
you may also need to use a complementing product like Funbox because the ongoing uh, capital, working capital needs would just increase because you have a bigger business, more customers. Uh, so you need a short-term solution to bridge this cash flow gap. Um, so it's, I think it's pretty important to uh, choose the right solution for the right need and that you can have the same, you know, you can have two or three different needs at the same uh, duration. Um, more specifically, it's also depend on your business cycle. So if you are a B2C business, meaning you're serving mostly uh, consumers and not businesses, and you're accepting credit card, your short-term cash flow gaps is probably mitigated by the fact that you're getting injection of cash from the credit card companies every three to seven days. So you may have less need of a product like Funbox and you need something else, or you don't need anything at all. Um, but if you're actually using invoices, and as you know, there's no point of sale for invoices, um, it would make a lot of sense to use something like Funbox because you're waiting a much longer duration to get paid. The, the average amount the small business needs um, in, in the segment we're addressing, which is mostly the B2B businesses, is not a large amount. It's just a small amount over uh, several periods of time. <clears throat> I think the average at any given point is around $40,000. And based on your specific business cycle, it could be much lower than that. Um, so it really depends on your specific needs at the current time and also longer term capital planning. Um, we generally like to see businesses that don't, and I think most companies here, don't overextend their, the credits they use. Um, there's a certain you know, formula that makes sense for you to use as debt. It's probably very efficient to use 30% of your overall business capital structure like Modigliani and Milner. Miller, uh, you know, formula of 30% is actually very helpful to your business, 40% is a stretch, <coughs> obviously depending on your margins, but there's certain credits that you don't want to use. Um, so would be also mindful of that, although it doesn't tie specifically to what, what product you're actually using, but you want to make sure that you're keeping a safety margin, that you know, it's a certain percentage of your overall revenue or uh, invoice cycle. Sounds great. So Spencer, your, your process is different too. Any advice on how long the process would take and any tips you can share with small business owners? Sure. Yeah, so the variety of businesses that we serve are across the board. So it's a lot of businesses that may have not begun operation yet and they're looking for their first bit of capital through us to even just get started or open some doors. We work with some more established businesses as well. So. I think, kind of echoing what James said, knowing what you're looking, exactly what you're looking for and having a good understanding of the smaller pieces to your larger project is, is great, so especially for Kiva Zip because we're such a small scale lender, $1,000 to $10,000 that for a lot of businesses, that's not a life changing amount of money. But when you think about your overall project, if it's $60,000 or $100,000, maybe there is a $5,000 piece to that puzzle marketing material, new equipment, so on and so forth that, for example, Kiva or another lender could be a great fit for. Um, and so tips to get ready for the Kiva process is just identifying very small pieces of your larger project that you could take advantage of a 0% interest piece of capital. Um, the process for us is very straightforward and easy, but a lot of people sort of discount Kiva because it's not going to fund your full project. So that's kind of an interesting way to think about your overall business and what you're looking for. Um, and also leveraging your network. I think a lot of the businesses that I've talked to are trying to undertake what they're going after by themselves. Um, and it's, it's a daunting thing and there are a lot of people in the room that can, that can help you. I um, mean, Kiva really prides ourselves on being a, a network about community and engaging your network, engaging partnerships, um, and we try to facilitate those as well through the fundraising process and, and afterwards after you're fully funded, um, but not going through it alone and relying on your, on your network. Great. So Erica, as from a customer perspective, does this resonate? If you were to go back in time, would you have done different things earlier in the process? How much time would you have given to yourself? Um, you know, to be honest with you, uh, all of these models are very quick models. Um, so if, if you really need to grab cash, you really only need, you know, a few hours of focus. And sure. I think for any entrepreneur, um, if you're wearing multiple hats, if you're, you know, you're, you're, you're 
accountant or whatever the case may be, um, right. you're back there making batches or you're manufacturing something or you're the service provider, you're all of those things. Um, to be able to sit down and focus and do something for a few minutes, 30 minutes of just focus and you can, you know, propel your business with financing. It's right. really all you need right. um, versus if you're going to do a traditional bank loan. Um, you know, I've talked to different banks. Um, I've gotten turned down by banks. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks to pull all of that data together. They want business plans. They want mm -hmm. pitch decks. They want you to meet with your small business development center and work right. on these projections and get all of these different things that you really don't have time to, to piece together. And it doesn't mean that you don't necessarily know everything you need to know about your business, but the bank wants to see all of this data um, that you just don't have at your fingertips. Right. Um, but with all of the financing that I've been able to kind of grab, I've, all, I've used all of my QuickBooks data, and that's mm -hmm. all that I've actually needed. Right. And for me, that works. So the only thing I would say is, you know, figure out what it is that you want, how much money you want to borrow, um, is it $50,000? Is it $100,000? And really just kind of put together a little game plan. You know, um, I want to use this company for this. They're, they're offering me $30,000. This company is offering me $10,000. Um, how am I going to pay this back? Can I pay this back? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's my business structure? Um, right. You know, am I going to be able to afford to pay this back? Right. Um, and once you do that, if you have a, a nice structure and game plan, maybe 30 minutes to an hour, hour of dedication, then you're on your way to getting what you need. So I was able to piece together. Um, to date, about $170,000, um, right. nice. which is That's pretty. Right. Sounds like you've had a great experience, and it sounds yeah. like in the customer life cycle too, right? You started a little smaller, and then you, you built up over time. Yes. Uh, which is definitely a theme that we hear. James, do you see that with your product? What is the customer life cycle like? Do customers come back for renewals, larger line sizes? Yeah, I think, um, and that's why I was kind of stressing the relationship aspect of it, which is, um, you know, we do um, uh, more than half of our borrowers come back and take a, a second um, loan or product with us. Um, and, you know, I think what we typically see is, um, you know, this, this cash infusion really helps you grow your, your business. And I love Erica's story. Um, you know, and, and it's something I think we all feel passionate about, which is we view our jobs as to help in a very small way you grow your business. Um, and that way we can help is by getting you the right capital at the right time with a very easy process. So I think, um, you know, when, when, when borrowers come back for renewals, um, we are going to re-underwrite you. Um, it's still a credit decision, so I want to make that clear. But typically what we see is businesses have grown. We're seeing that credit profile uh, improve a little bit. So then when you come back for a renewal, you're going to get... Um, if it's a term loan, you, you'll probably get a larger line. Um, on average, our renewal loans are larger than our first loans. Um, you're going to get potentially a longer term because as we build that relationship, um, and it's something Al mentioned, you know, we're, we're trying to build a relationship with you, and that very much does matter. Um, so we can extend credit for longer periods. We can give you a revolving line of credit instead of a term loan, which actually gives you, the, the, the small business owner, more flexibility on how you draw and then pay that down. So I think that you know you really should be trying to build that relationship um, and really understand sort of you know how you might use a lender over time. Um, and then the last thing I would say is just you know we all focus on the 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 technology and and in some ways the analytics because what we're trying to do is come up with a better way to make a credit decision that really takes the onus off of you. But we want to build a relationship with you. So at On Deck, you know you, you want to talk to somebody. Um, you're going to talk to somebody. Once you take a loan with us, you have a dedicated sort of account manager who's there to answer any one of your questions. So I think, like, don't treat us like we're just, you know, websites or we're just cash. We're actually here to help you grow your business. Um, and I think that level of service, you know, helping you understand what the product is, understanding that if you're going to take a $50,000 loan or a $250,000 loan, that's a big decision for you. You know, you should, you should ask us questions. You should make sure that, you know, we can give you clear answers. Um, and you should feel good about that relationship um, because I think it's something that can really grow and prosper over time. Great. Thank you. Al, what have you been seeing in terms of invoicing and repeat customers and uh, yeah. trends emerging? <laughs> so <clears throat> because the nature of the product, which is focused on the invoice cycle, obviously small businesses um, invoice on an ongoing basis. So we see, um, we basically, once you underwrite someone and you uh, accept it to the platform, um, they keep, you know, depending on the business cycle, they keep using it on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis. Mm -hmm. 
it's an ongoing product. It's not um, a one-time turn on and the relationship ends. Right. It's actually escalating and usage patterns are increasing as, as more they use the product. And I think it's not so much, it's basically the product speaks for itself. So the, the way we design it, we start with the user experience. What would be the best user experience for this specific product? And then we worry about the technology on the back end and how we can actually make sure that we eventually get paid back. Right. Uh, that was a very uh, heavy lifting from our side and we want to make sure that you get the right product and the dividend that we're seeing now is that customers just increasing the usage patterns. It's, uh, it just make a lot of sense uh, for the way they're running the business um, and managing the cash flow. If you think about the, the actual value proposition of Funbox, yeah, it's solving a it's, called, it's solving a cash flow issue, but it's really a tool or a utility to optimize the way you manage your business uh, when it comes down to the cash flow gaps. It's not a lending relationship. Um, and I think that encourages a very high uh, engagement and re-engagement in usage pattern. Okay. Um, the, the flip side is that because it's a machine that focuses on your, you know, on your books and your business, there's no human uh, discretion. So if your business is doing better, you get more credit. If it's doing less good, what's the right thing for the business for you is actually to get less credit for any, at any, any given time. But given the fact that you know, we, we do have people in the company, not only a machine to, to, you know, to provide the service, um, <coughs> we relate to the notion of some, someone you need to talk to a person. So we have a uh, you know, 24 seven customer support uh, service. Uh, we don't get a ton of call, but we think for some people the, the human element is very important. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure it's there. It's also a very good tool for us to get feedback from the customers and understand how we can improve the product in the, pre in the next version, in the next version. Perfect, great. Well, Spencer, we're at QB Connect and, and we talk about the power of community and, and the power of small businesses working together. Uh, we took QB Connect on the road and, and went to a lot of local communities. Um, any advice you could give to small business owners about getting involved locally in the community uh, or things that you guys have learned uh, through your model? Yeah, so the kind of the background on Kiva right now, we're, we're all about hyper-local focus. So specifically, I manage the Bay Area program. So a lot of my examples will come from local um, activities. But uh, we have done about 350 loans to Bay Area small businesses. And I think w the one thing that we've learned is that small businesses like yours are, are the greatest resources that we have to be able to connect and make connections for other folks. Um, so we are a lender. We provide 0% interest loans. But I think the, the second value add for us is to be able to make those connections for you. Um, depending on where you are in the country, we've, we've established a lot of great relationships with technical assistance providers, other lenders like OnDeck, where after you've fully funded on Kiva, we can make recommendations for larger lenders that you can then go to. Or if you need other resources, um, what other businesses have gone through that path similar to yours that we can connect you with. So I think kind of a secondary value proposition for us that we've learned and that we're, we're now just starting to develop is other ways that we can support small businesses, not just through financing, um, that, that couldn't happen without the community that we've built. Um, and I think the, the big part of the process with Kiva at the beginning that I mentioned before is that private fundraising period where you go out to your personal community and personal network um, to generate support. For us, that, that's credit worthiness in our eyes. So just the fact that you have community and you can, you can show us that, that's enough for us that, that shows us that you are your credit worthiness. So I think community in that sense is, is key for us. Great. Well, Erica, you, you're both local and you're also national uh, with mail order business. Any advice you'd give to the audience in terms of local, how to get involved in your community and, and how it's impacted your business? You know, I just started using Own It, so that's been super cool for me. Um, I think uh, a lot of times when you're an entrepreneur, you're in your own bubble, mm -hmm. and literally from the time you get into the office or wherever you're doing business to the time you leave, you don't have a chance to interact with anyone except for your customers or your employees. Um, so it's very important to take advantage of 
um, a community that you're already in, which is QuickBooks Online. So mm -hmm. using Own It is really cool. Um, outside of that, I usually go to, you know, local conferences or panels uh, where I can learn something, meet somebody, um, and usually I can make a connection that can help me further my business. Um, mm -hmm. And I try to do that once a month. I don't commit to <laughs> any more than that because I feel like, you know, now I, I don't want to be a networking buff. I just want to, you know, get out there and kind of connect and meet some people that can that I can help or or they can help me. So right. um, I think it's super important to stay involved. But you know, if you have a, a, a iPhone and <laughs> you can download on it, and, and that really helps too because you can ask questions and you can also um, answer questions and then meet meet somebody for coffee or go by their business and see what they're doing. So that, that sounds works. great. Well, we're excited to. We have the Own It booth here, um, and one of the topics on Own It is financing. So it gives yeah. uh, small business owners a great chance to share their stories and tips and techniques. So definitely uh, want to yeah. echo your sentiments, and uh, thank you for that. So we're going to move to the audience for questions. But before we do that, and while we tee up the mics and everything, uh, We've been talking a little bit about social media and, and how that starts to come into play in the process. Um, James, I was wondering if you could comment, are you guys using social media uh, or even things that, that folks uh, should consider as, as they start to uh, go deeper there? Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the whole topic of, of sort of what I would say new data, social media, um, I think can be a little bit misunderstood. So. At the end of the day, we unequivocally use it. We love it. We're trying to learn as much as we can about your business. And you know, there, there is information out there, like Yelp reviews, um, that really can, can tell you something about your business. Um, but you know, I think what's really important for you all to understand is its relative importance. So if you were to think through like cash flow data or accounting data and sort of say, how important is that? And then my Yelp reviews, they're not even close. They're not even the same ballpark. What we're trying to find with social data is stuff on the margin that, that helps us learn a little bit more about your business. And you know, specifically the way On Deck works is, um, I'm not sure how much you all know about credit scores, but your consumer credit score basically starts off at perfect and then you get knocked down for, for negatives. Um, the On Deck score works exactly the opposite. You start off at zero and what we look for is positive characteristics of the business that then add to your points. And once we get above a certain level, that means we'll lend to you and then as you get a higher credit score, what that's gonna mean is we'll lend you more money, longer term, lower rates. Um, and so I think the presence of social data just helps. Um, and I think you know, it's something that just tells people about your business, um, not just lenders, but other people about your business. So what I would say is um, you know, use it to just point. Don't stress over it too much. Um, you know, as a lender, we don't expect you to be perfect. Uh, we have a great, you know, pro social profile at On Deck. We work really hard for it. Uh, have we had negative reviews? Of course we have, you know. Um, but we try really, really hard not to make those happen. You know, for every negative review, we have hundreds or thousands of positive experiences. So we know that you're not going to be perfect. Um, but what I would say is try to use it, and then you know, it's in a way where you know, if you feel it's a positive, you should be highlighting that to some folks. A lot of us are pulling it in, but if you're talking to someone who hasn't looked at it and you have a very positive Yelp profile, I would mention it to them. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we use hundreds of digital indicators. Some of them are social. It's really, I agree with you, it's really on the margins. Uh, once you go online and you know, you're almost fully, you're fully automated or almost fully automated, basically, unfortunately, not everybody is honest out there, so they're going to be all kind of fraud attempts. So the social data in some context could be very helpful to uh, verify identity and uh, how long your business is out there. I think it has more value for marketing perspective for your businesses uh, than go and find a credit line. Um, so yeah, we look at it, but it's, it's on the margin. It's not the essence of what we're actually trying to understand. Yeah, the specific example of how we use social media in our process is very basic. So in the process of applying for a loan, if we see that you have a social media presence, whether it's basic or established, that's great for us. That's one of the variables that we look at to judge if you have um, a network that can basically start to believe in you. So if you have a lot of Facebook likes or a lot of Twitter followers, then that will lower the number of people that you need to go out and recruit during that first time period, um, that 15-day private funding window. 
Uh, other than that, we use it obviously heavily to promote and engage with the Kiva brand and help promote the people that are fundraising on our platform. Um, but other than that, we use it as a, a measurement of um, sort of your credit worthiness. Awesome. I'm going to see if there's any questions out there from the audience. So we have a panel representing some very difficult, uh, uh, very different products and want to see if any folks have questions. Yes, James, you mentioned um, using information to streamline some of the decisions making on, on the loans that, uh, um, from uh, on deck. If uh, one doesn't qualify based upon that information that's given, do you guys provide you know, help um, and, and guidance to get them on track to getting uh, a loan? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the way our process is set up is, is you know, if unfortunately we're not able to approve you, um, we will try to give advice if we feel like we have good advice to give. Um, and there's credit education where, you know, we own a site called businessloans.com, um, but that's just an education site. It's not on deck trying to sell loans. So if we feel like that can be helpful, we, we might refer you there. Um, there's Creditera, which is sort of a credit repair um, tool for small businesses where we have a, a relationship with them as well, where if we feel like there's something that we did find in your business credit file, um, you know, or quite frankly, in your personal credit file, because we do look at the data. We're not looking at your, at your FICO score, but we are looking and trying to see, have you been borrowing personally to support your small business and what does that look like? Um, if we think that there's maybe sort of some credit repair that might help you, we'll refer you there. Um, but what we don't do is we're, we're, we're respectful of the fact that, you know, you applied to us for credit. If we can't help you, we will try to help and just guide you. But really, you know, we feel like, you know, we're not going to refer you to other lenders. Um, we're not going to try to send you someplace where, you know, we don't feel that you would have a great experience. Um, and so sometimes we feel like we can help with one of those options. Other times, quite frankly, you know, we just, we unfortunately don't feel like we can help, but we're trying to be very upfront and transparent about, uh, about that as well. Great. Hey, Al Spencer, anything you guys would add? Uh if the process isn't going well in terms of things they can do or, or resources you guys can add? So, yeah, one, one of the things that we offer, usually when there are many reasons why you cannot approve someone, okay. um, some of them are just data related. Okay. So either there's not enough data or there's a mixed data. So basically what we encourage people that are pending in this limbo area to do is uh, to stay connected to the platform and we have an ongoing model in addition to the onboarding model mm -hmm. and this ongoing model you know if the data is good could you can just get an email um, after a month after three months that you qualified for a credit line could be small it could be big but mm -hmm. basically we just stay there and trying to uh, to see if the data is improving or it's just more rich data to underwrite you for Kiva, the qualifications um, for our program are very basic. You just have to be over 18. Um, so <laughs> you, nearly everyone qualifies. So the point on that is if you're looking for $5,000, for example, um, and on paper you're incredibly risky, we might suggest that you start off with $1,000. And then if, after you repay that over the course of a couple of months, you can then qualify for maybe that $5,000 that you came for originally. Um, but I think one of the greatest things about Kiva is that we're lending to people that basically everyone has n said no to, um, which is a very kind of powerful and great place to be. Um, so it could be a great resource for folks that have tried a ton of different avenues and just um, can't seem to get it. Um, but that's how nearly everyone qualifies. And once we reach that public funding um, phase, so you're live active on the site, we have a 95% success rate here in the United States. So um, it could be a great resource for people that started somewhere, got turned down, and this could be a great kind of avenue for us to, to get your feet wet. So max lending amount and then rate. So uh, annual rate. Sure. Spencer, you want to start? Yeah, so in over the US, depending on where you are, it's a bit different. So if you're in New York or San Francisco, our max loan amount is 10K. Um, it's at 0% interest and the repayment is up to three years on a 10K loan. Everywhere else in the U.S. we do $1,000 to $5,000, still 0% interest and the repayment is one to two years and that is monthly repayments. Yeah, 
our sweet spot say is around 30k, 35k. We go higher, we definitely go lower. Um, on the annual rate, so I described the way the model works. Each invoice is underwritten separately, meaning each invoice has a separate risk to it, uh, depending on factors that depend on your business, but also factors that depend on the counterparty of the invoice. Um, so it's one thing if IBM is on the other side of the invoice or another small business on the other side of the invoice. But overall, the range would be anything from half a percent per invoice per month all the way to 2.5% per invoice per month. The average is somewhere in between. Okay, thanks. Jane? Um, and for us, uh, on our term loan product, uh, the max amount is $500,000. Um, the max amount on our line of credit product is $100,000. Um, and then, you know, I think we're very much similar in the way that we price. It's risk-based pricing. So in our, on our term loan product, um, you know, from an APR perspective, the lowest rate you can get is 5.99%. Um, the term loans that we make, also a lot of them are sub uh, one year. So again, um, APR there is a really tough metric because if you take a six month loan, the annual rate's gonna be 4X what the actual cash cost is. Um, so the average rate of a six month loan is about 12 cents on the dollar um, in terms of you know, what you're gonna pay back. Um, and then uh, the line of credit is um, a, uh, a, an annual rate based product. It's as low as 13.9% um, and then the highest rate we have is in the low 30s. Great, so I think I'm gonna ask the last question and it's really a, a forward looking question. So as you all sort of look out in the future a year or two from now, um, where do you see the space evolving to and more specifically for your company? Uh, how do you see changes in product? Uh, James, maybe I'll yeah. have you start. Um, so I, I just think it's a really exciting time. Um, and I think if you look out um, a year or two, I don't think anything is gonna be dramatically different, meaning that something brand new is gonna pop up. I actually think what you're gonna see is what folks like us are doing um, with QuickBooks is actually gonna become much more mainstream and is probably gonna become the norm, not, not quite frankly the exception um, where I still think you know, a lot of people believe the right thing for them to do is to walk into a branch and start a conversation with a bank. And so specifically in a couple years, I mean, I think there's a real powerful way in which you know, we can work with folks like QuickBooks, where if you think about the loan process and you realize the data you have, you, know, you can have a pre-approved offer that is enabled through QuickBooks, um, which is important for two reasons. One is it tells you something unique about the lender um, it tells you it's data driven, but it's also coming from a trusted source, right? And so I think that that's really important. And you know, then you're literally a couple clicks away from getting financing your business needs. That's such a dramatic difference from where we were you know, two years ago and even where we are today. Um, so I just think it's, it's gonna be a really exciting time. I think capital is gonna get much more individualized and specific to each individual business. And I think that the way that, that you all are gonna access capital is gonna really be um, kind of enabled by relationships like this and much less by about walking into a branch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, I think in the short term, which is your you know, example of one to two years, no major changes, um, just continuation of the trend we see today. Uh, medium term, which you know, if you look at the history of financial services, could be a few years, it's more than two or three years. I would say that you see a fundamental shift in the balance of power in financial services, where companies like you know, Apple Pay, Google would pr play less of a pivotal role than companies that actually have very relevant data, like Intuit and the competitors in this space. Um, longer term, um, you know, there are a few trends that you know, there are credit card companies and banks that are the traditional liquidity providers for consumer and small businesses. Uh, eventually, if you're using alternative products, um, not necessarily around credit, because it's a better user experience, there's also no reason why you wouldn't use saving, payment, and credit uh, when using those other platforms, because it's just a better product. Because they don't have like branches and all kind of regulatory and compliance and uh, operational overhead costs that they have to deal with. So I think longer term, it will be a major shift. 
And I think specifically for the problem we're solving today, which is around you know, how long you guys have to wait to get paid on an invoice, it's not always the case, but if you look at the, the larger customers, so whether it's Procter & Gamble, Walmart, uh, Whole Foods, um, I think whether intentionally or not today, you see that most of them are actually using their supplier base as a free of charge financing solution. And I don't think that's sustainable over time. There are a few ways to solve it. Uh, one of them is to use Funbox, but it's just not right and it doesn't make any economic sense. So eventually it's gonna change. Great. Spencer, what do you see on your side? Yeah, for Kiva, Zip, in the next one to two years, um, I don't think, again, any huge changes. We might try to expand our offering as far as offering a larger amount of money to small businesses, but I think the biggest challenge or the biggest shift will be the ease at which and the speed at which you will be able to access and receive funds on Kiva. It's already fast, but the rate that our lender base is growing, since we're a two-sided marketplace, it's very healthy. And so the more lenders there are in the world that are eager to support small businesses like yours, the experience will only get better. Um, I think next year will be an exciting time for that, um, where people are getting money quicker um, and lenders are finding and accessing Kiva more so now than they ever had before. Um, and I think QuickBooks and the partnerships that we've been able to establish are only gonna help penetrate our brand as well. I think for us, the, one of the biggest hurdles is people know Kiva, people don't know Kiva Zip. So overcoming that hurdle is, is definitely gonna happen in the next year or two. Great, I appreciate it. Well, I wanna thank each of the panelists. Uh, Spencer, I know you'll be around at the show and uh, stopping off even too at the QuickBooks financing. So if folks have individual questions, Al, I know you guys have a booth yep. uh, in the exhibit hall and I know your team is here. Uh, James, I think you're on Main Street um, and, and have folks who can help with questions. Uh, Erica, thank you. Always thank you. really appreciate your thank insights. You. Uh, for everyone in the audience too, I should mention, uh, we have some of Erica's products. I'm yeah. a huge fan of the bacon rub and the uh, yeah. strawberry pancakes, which we have made at home. So yeah. wish you continued success. Thank you. Before we close out, I, I wanted to summarize uh, a couple things that, that we heard as we were going through. Um, so getting financing is really a journey. Um, and a lot of times you start off with some smaller loan sizes. A lot of times you're trying to establish your business. You're trying to establish it on social media and quite frankly, uh, even on an accounting and growth perspective. So keep in mind that journey, you very well might go through refinances. You might start off small. Over time, you can keep building your loans, uh, continue to grow with, with the products that our panelists have here. And even there's some additional products such as SBA loans and, and other term loans that are available. So wanted to call that out. We also got a, a question on resources, uh, what's available out there. So a lot of different places you can go. Uh, each of our individual financial partners have some great information. Uh, at QuickBooks Financing, we're trying to grow out our library of resources that are available. Some great not-for-profits out there. Um, a lot of times, a lot of fellow business owners who have gone through the process of so SCORE, ASBDC, um, definitely recommend you folks reach out there and find some information. Then we encourage everyone, let's keep the conversation going. If you can uh, tweet out your experiences at hashtag QBConnect, uh, and please stop by if you haven't signed up yet to the Own It Network, where you can share your own stories and tips and techniques. Wish everyone a great show, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.